Welcome to Camera Shake Podcast, episode 131. And today we are going to be talking about how to balance photography with family life and how to get enough time to build a successful wedding business in 2022 or 2023. Let's face it, we're almost there. So if you know, if you want to know who our amazing, awesome guest is on today's show, straight after this. In today's episode, I'm joined by the multi-talented portrait and wedding photographer, YouTuber, photography speaker, and generally one of the nicest guys you ever meet, Tommy Reynolds. Tommy, man, <laughs> good to see you back. Thank you so much, man. I always enjoy it coming on this show for the introduction. It always just makes me feel so good. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. You need, you need to rewrite the uh, the bio in my About Me section on my website because uh, I, I forget how many... How many fingers I? How many pies I have fingers in? That's it. That sound. That sounded better in my head. But no, thank you very much for having me, man. How are you? Awesome. It's I'm great, man. It's good to have you back. Um, I don't know if you know this, but there's there's like um there's like an internal competition going on between between <laughs> Dave Williams, uh, you. So um, I'm I'm actually not I'm not 100 sure how many times you've been on the show, but but yeah, several times. Yeah, I, I, I'm aware of it. I'm aware of it. I listen to the podcast, obviously, and uh, I hear Dave and I hear you. I, I, I hear the competition. Um, so I've just got another notch on the belt today. I don't think I'm quite near Dave's yet, so I might need to come back on next it's year. Getting maybe. There. It's getting there. But, you know, what would be super fun would be to have both you and Dave on the podcast at the same time. Because yeah, it, it would just be then a, then a competition of who speaks more then yeah. in that episode then. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. But so how have you been, man? Things have changed for you quite a bit. Oh my god, things have changed massively since we've last spoke. Got, I've, I've now a dad. I've now got a seven month old. That's been the the biggest change. And the other big change is uh, to my business, where I've now done a bit of a shift, where now I shoot more weddings instead of portrait work. And um, I do some portrait work, but now ninety percent of my work is now driven to uh, do more wedding work. And we can go into it why and how, but yeah, that that's that's been the reality. And I'm and I'm loving it, man, loving it. And that's, I mean, that's an important, that's an important aspect because of course, part of what we're going to talk about today is, you know, how to balance your family life, especially with the seven month old. And I, I remember, although it's been a good 10 years ago, but I remember very well how much time and effort you have to put into that. Um, and you know, what kind of impact that has on, on everything else yeah. that you do. Uh, but of course, uh, running a wedding business also requires a lot of time and commitment and you know balancing that again is is quite a tricky thing so how, how have you found adjusting to your role like your new role as a dad well i think the biggest thing so i've been a freelancer now 10 years next year 2023 um i'd have been freelancing 10 years and i thought in 10 years i've got my time management skills down and i realize when you become a dad no you don't <laughs> you really don't so that was the biggest learning curve for me was uh, realizing how to manage my time. And so one of the biggest things that I now do is I treat my freelancing work like a nine to five job. I have to now. So I come rain or shine at nine o'clock, I have to be sat in my office um, and I have to be doing my work. And I found that very, very difficult at first to pull myself away from doing daddy duty and uh, that helping Emily when when it, when she needs it and uh, and working from home generally is is hard because if you hear baby crying as well it's like oh you want to you just want to get up out of your seat and then before long you've been an hour where you've then oh I'll just do the washing or I'll just put and um, take the stuff out of the dishwasher and uh, so that's been the biggest thing for for me to uh, to overcome is the time management skills so as I say, now I treat it more like a nine to five and just try and be sat here at nine. And so, um, also to balance that, stop at five. And that I think is even harder, especially as a freelancer. And when you're when you're as passionate about what we do as we are, it's an, it's hard if you're in a role to stop. When it gets to five, I need to kind of, right, that's it. I need to get the dinner on, need to need to uh, sort the troops out, make sure everyone's happy. Um, so yeah, that's that's been... The biggest learning curve for me was the, the time management skills. It's, you know, the stopping bit has definitely always been the hardest thing for me. It's it's very difficult uh, for me to, to switch my brain off. You just switch oh, to kind of work brain off. Um, and my wife's been very good at pulling me back in into family life, you know. Mm. Um, so I, 
I'm eternally grateful for her to, you know, to constantly, she's, she's really, I mean, for a long time, she's always on my case. You know, like, <laughs> right, you got to stop. I'm like, oh, I just had this one idea, though. <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> you know? it, but it's so easy, though. So um, when I think back to what my life looked like before, so in, in only two years, I've, um, Emily and I have moved into our house, we've got married, and we've had our son. So we've done so much in two years, and that was... Obviously, during lockdown as well, we were moving into our home. So we did so much in two years. And when I think what my life was like before I I moved into my home, I lived with my parents before, and I wasn't really accountable before, and I didn't really have a ton of responsibility. So this has been a massive learning curve as well, because I could easily work till one, two, three in the morning, and there wasn't a consequence there because I, I didn't have a home. I didn't have to worry about things like that. So... But yeah, that that is that has been a, le- a big learning curve, and I'm, I don't want and I don't want to sugarcoat it because I I feel like I did this on my own YouTube channel when I was speaking with Hannah Cousins. Um, I felt like when I watched it back, I might have been sugarcoating it a little bit. And the reality is, it was very very hard. The first six months ha- have been very hard to to do that adjustment. I think in my case, especially going from having my own home and the responsibilities of paying the bills and uh, looking after my wife and now looking after my son so there that, that it, it was it was a big learning curve and uh, it was more, way harder than I thought it would be and so if if guys are listening to this and they've become recent dads um I think the biggest thing for me is been um speaking with your friends speaking with others so I I, I actually went for a, a spade before before George I I had um I was um having counseling and realized that it was more of a temporary fix and what I realized that the best thing for me was speaking to others and speaking to friends and thankfully it's not so much of a taboo nowadays where men are speaking out um, but that definitely did help me is having a close group of friends who who, who can relate to you so I uh, have a group of friends who are dads and I can speak to them about um, like this guilt feeling this was the biggest thing I know I'm going off on the tangent but in the first six months is feeling the guilt of going back to work. Two two weeks paternity is no, is not long enough, by the way. It's not long enough, but um, it's not no. Um, but I remember feeling so guilty at the thought where I, I need to go back to work or I need to start earning some money. Um, I think it's harder because as a freelancer, at least when you're working for someone, it's like, well, the boss needs me there, and I've got to go there. But when you are your own boss, that makes it even harder to pull yourself away. And, uh, it's, and as I say, that, that constant guilt feeling. And I spoke to a few friends and I said, uh, like, do you ever have this guilt feeling? And they said, oh, yeah, yeah, massively. And again, just speaking to others, speaking to friends and realizing that I'm not alone and others feel the same. Um, yeah, that was that was the biggest thing for me. But now, as I say, it's now this is now a nine to five job. It has to be. It creates that balance. And at the photography show this year, I was doing a talk similarly about this subject. And I said... I used to believe that the key to success was progression. If you're not progressing, you're not succeeding. And now when I look back at those YouTube videos and those talks, I I think I had a different mindset then because that was when all I cared about was 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 the business and being the best I could be and not n- and neglecting family and friends. Now I finished that talk off by saying, I no longer think the key to success is progression. I believe now the key to success is harmony and finding that balance and striking that balance between your work and family life. So, um, uh, so nine to five job, treat it like that. I've got a daily goals book. Um, I write affiliations as well in the mornings of what I'm grateful for. And another thing I do is I work in 90 minute segments, 90 minute chunks. So I'll set a timer on my phone um, and I find 90 minutes is a good time. An hour, I might just need a bit extra to really sink my teeth into a task. But now I try and do my goals in 90 minute chunks and then I feel like I've ticked off lots of things that day. So those have been the biggest things that have helped me um, in this venture in the last seven months since having a child. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, I have a tendency personally to over schedule my days. Like I mm. always think in my head, I think a day is longer than it actually is. Oh, yeah. And so, you know, when I when I put tasks in my diary, like for any particular day, I, I, you know, I can be guaranteed to leave things unfinished because I just put too much into the day. Then. And so I had to, so that, that's my tendency. And uh, so I had to learn how to spread that out and to how to be realistic with what 
it can actually be achieved in, in a certain amount of time. Oh yeah, I I I think from from as a filmmaker as well, I think it's so easy to things always take longer, or they always take longer than than they do. Even like big photo shoots, there needs the you need time to set them up. And in the beginning, I'd always neglect that and think, oh God, look look, we've we've been here two hours and we haven't taken a single image. Like now, I I can accept that it might take an hour or two set up, and then another half an hour to really get things off, and you've got your first shot. So yeah, I can appreciate that things do take longer than they do. Um, but sometimes I will have weekly goals. So if I, I will then push it to the to the weekly goal list if it doesn't quite get done that day, um, and just or just break break it down into bite size. So if you know you're not going to get something that thing done that day, can that one task be split into maybe two or three tasks, and then at least you can tick something off towards that, yeah. and then maybe push it to the next day or maybe make it spread over that course of that week yeah i found, I found that um and I've, I've learned that actually so the hard way um i found that uh, building on little successes you know little incremental successes will actually keep you in that sort of happiness mindset you know and keep you motivated because it's, there's nothing more demotivating than than realizing that you're you haven't managed to complete those tasks you know 100 percent. no it does it do, it does um, you th you think oh this is uh, uh this is supposed to be making my my life easier writing down these tasks and then you just end up getting more frustrated because you haven't done them <laughs> yeah so I try and uh, limit the tasks to realistic goals I did the same thing at the start so now I think I've got I feel like I know roughly how long I'm going to take on certain tasks and. As I say, if I don't, then it splits into three or it splits over to that week. So again, in this, in my daily goals book, um, I've got, a, I can section it off to monthly goals, weekly goals or daily goals. So something like doing an online course or doing a big YouTube video, that's, that might not be done in a whole day. That might be done over three days. So it will go in a weekly goal because um, it might need time to plan it, then shoot it, then, um, then edit it and then put it together and then send it off that sort of thing so yeah um split splitting your goals i think is ultimately going to make you make them feel more digestible and achievable so how do you balance your week off because i mean as a as a wedding shooter i'm, I'm guessing you work weekends or most weekends well uh, most of the time they're weekends though because of covid um weekdays uh, have been uh, quite popular um because because people have just been trying to pushed from 2000 obviously in 20 to i'm only just now getting over all of the weddings that have been postponed but now weekday weddings are now becoming popular they they're cheaper they're usually cheaper so which is great news for me because then that means i'm working more than just the weekends but mostly it's weekends yeah actually yeah coming to kind of think of it i think my wedding happened on a wednesday if I remember yeah. correctly. M mine was a Wednesday. It was yeah. just a bit cheaper. It was yeah, exactly. five grand cheaper to get married on Wednesday than it was on Saturday. No brainer. And in fact, that, that was better for me because all my friends are freelancers so, or, or musicians. And so they were more than likely busy on that weekend. So that yeah. was actually better for us. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so actually talking about, you know, your, your wedding photography business, um, if, I mean, I know you've been shooting weddings before before the pandemic, mm -hmm. um, and then of course, I mean, then the pandemic happened, and uh, I guess in the wedding photography industry generally, everything went down to zero for a bit. Yeah, um, and yeah. you've just mentioned it's you've, you're just about Stop. at the point where you're sort of catching up with all of all of the shoots that had been or all the weddings have been postponed mm -hmm. at the time. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So how do you how do you combine you know your YouTube channel, um, your you know your wedding business, which uh, seems to have gotten considerably more busy than it was before, yeah. and you know and family life and everything else. How do you yeah. how do you put all of that into one? Okay, yeah, oh, that's a big question. All right, so yeah, you're right. During 2020, when we had, when in lockdown, weddings were absolutely zero, and that's when I started a new strand of my business, which was more the training side of things, and I was doing um, pay what you want online coaching. Um, I saw a uh, another person on Instagram doing something similar and I got the idea to do it but they were like they were inviting people oh let me know when you're free we'll get a date in and I'll send you some pricing and I thought that that's too hard there's too many things for someone to do so there's a thing on Squarespace where it's um, uh, acute scheduling where 
they can come on and they choose the hour that that's convenient to them. And in in terms of price, I said you just pay me what you want. So that got me through COVID, uh, got me through COVID uh, when weddings weren't happening. And it wasn't until we knew we were going to have George, my son, that I realised it it totally shifted my perspective in life and made me think about the priorities and what what I've been um, what I need to change. And wedding photography, arguably. It does. It it makes me way more money, way more money than anything else I do. Ironically, I started my my journey in photography doing portraits, and had been doing that for years until I started doing weddings. Um, and then I did the training side of things over COVID. And um, and it's just ironic that the thing I started with doing the portraits now actually make me the least amount of money. To be honest, it's now the weddings and the training which now make me more money. So I guess if you want to take something from this is don't be afraid to try something different. Don't feel like you have to be a master of one thing. I think especially nowadays, you can niche yourself into different things. I would just say have multiple websites, though. Don't have everything on one website, otherwise it just becomes a portfolio website. But if you want to try other things and turn it into a service, then just make sure you have a separate website that that speaks to a different type of audience. So my About Me sections of all three websites are slightly different because I'm obviously targeting a different audience and it's good for SEO as well. Um, so back to what I was saying. So um, when I when we learned that we were going to have George, it made me realize that I want to be earning more money. I want, it, I want it sustainable. I want to know roughly what I'm going to get in the future um, in terms of payment, which is the benefit of weddings because I can take deposits. I know when their balance is going to be due. And... Um, and I realized how much I enjoyed weddings after also I got married myself. I finally can empathize with the groom when he's standing at the end of the aisle or the altar. And I I, I, I can empathize with that feeling. In, obviously, being a photographer, I was aware of the photographers and the videographers. But as soon as the music started and Emily started walking down, I was tunnel vision and completely ignored everything else. And that moment, that feeling... Um, and what our photographers were able to capture, I thought, oh, I really want to do that. I really want to do that. And um, also there's less gear. There's le- there's more planning, fair enough, but there's so much less gear when it comes to wedding photography. Now, when I tell people I would now prefer to photograph someone's wedding than do a big corporate studio shoot, they say, are you mad? You would rather shoot a wedding day, which if it goes wrong, that's it. Like, at least you can restage the studio day. And I empathize with that and I get that. But with a studio shoot, I get anxiety about making sure I've got everything. Like, look at look at the back, look at everything behind me. Like, most of this has to go if I'm doing a big studio shoot. And if I forget the trigger or if I forget batteries or if I forget the tether cable, it's just like, it's it's a major, major thing if I forget one thing. So I get I get a lot of anxiety about those big shoots just forgetting one thing and then I have to load my car up which isn't the biggest car either so I worry about that as well so making the switch to weddings has earned me more money as I don't have to carry as much gear um, and I I genuinely enjoy the storytelling aspect as a filmmaker there's nothing better and you're 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 surrounded by people that are happy that are dressed well uh, and you're you're telling a story that's arguably the best day of their life. And I love having that responsibility and capturing that. Having worked in the music industry um, in the start of my journey, it's a very cutthroat industry and not really... It's, uh, when you get as, as high as I once did, um, you, you're on a pedestal and you're not very appreciative, appreciated about what you do. You shoot work for an artist and three months later they're going to need new material so your old material just becomes old hat so it sounds lovely and it sounds great and it sounds cool that you can say yeah I worked with this person or this artist or this brand but there's nothing quite like photographing someone's wedding day where those images are going to live with them for generations and that responsibility I take very seriously and I love that so that's the reason why everything I've mentioned is why I've made that kind of progression and that change to shooting more weddings so as I said as you said quite rightly I was shooting weddings before 
it was only about 20% of the business. It's now 90% of the business. Mm. I do the odd portrait shoot, but now my most of my time is taken up with weddings. It's funny that you mentioned the gear, um, and uh, you know, you said you could fit it into your car. I've recently downsized my car quite dramatically. Okay, and um, and so I, you know, I, the only thing I had to make sure was that I I could fit a C stand in there. That was that was the criteria. Like, okay, if I could fit a C stand in there, there. then uh, it's fine. You know. Yeah, but um, I did a number of uh, video shoots um, only only last week in Central London, and I thought. You know, the cost factor and the aggro factor of driving into London uh, with all my gear in the back uh, was really something I didn't want to do. So I co I condensed everything to fit into a backpack or onto the backpack and under the seat of my Vespa. And I basically Vespa'd it in into centre London. Which Amazing. Was incredible. Incredible. I mean, such a sense of freedom. Oh, I bet. I bet. If, yeah. if I can, if I can... If I can get away with doing a headshot, a very basic headshot in London, and I can get on the train, I will do that every time. I I, I will do everything I can to avoid driving to London <laughs> if I have to. Yeah, because you know, I thought like, right, if I take the scooter, then you know, a it's fun, and uh, and b I don't have to worry about parking. You know, I think three three out of the four days I've parked. Yeah, three out of the four days I parked totally for free, and on one day I had to pay. One pound forty for a twenty-four hour motorcycle. Oh slot. my god, that's that's insane. Yeah, that's right? insane. So uh, and, you I know, just love that image. I didn't even know you owned a Vespa, and I just love. I'm just. I love that image now of you with your gear and like rocking up. Like, right, I've got. I got oh, where's your gear? Got it all here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it was all like you know. I had a tripod attached to my backpack. Um, I had you know other bits and bobs under underneath the seat because it's a little compartment under the seat. Um. And yeah, I could, I could take a gimbal, you know, camera, lenses, everything I needed for that day, for that shoot, absolutely no problem. Even a gimbal as well, that's Even great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so um, yeah, I had, uh, so, you know, I was, I was really equipped for all eventualities. Um, it was it was great. Um, and I could, I, I could completely complete the shoot without having, without needing any, any additional gear. Um, you know, but I thought long and hard about what I was going to take and how I'm going to pack it and you know, um, and it you know it saved me a ton of money. Also, it also saved me a lot of time because it was just so much quicker getting to central London from where I am, um, and getting out again. Um, and you know, and that turned what would otherwise have been a fairly not that I wouldn't say boring day, but not very eventful, into something that was actually fairly entertaining because I you know I love writing that thing. So. Yeah, yeah, I bet. I, I, yeah, as you said, the freedom to just go where you want, not get caught in traffic. Um, yeah, I mean, if I owned a Vespa, I, I'd be doing the same. I was, I mean, that's you know, that's actually one of the reasons why I downsized my car because um, we, you know, we we were a one car family. Um, we got rid of the second car at the beginning of the pandemic because we, mm -hmm. we just thought, you know, now we've got two cars sitting on the tarmac and we're not moving any of those, so <laughs> let's just get rid of one of them. And then let's see if we can if we can be a one car family, yeah. Um, and you know we thought like, well, if it doesn't work out, we'll get another car, no problem. But uh, it did actually work out really well. Do you think that's because you also ha you have the Vespa just in case you need to get around? Yeah. So basically, so it worked out really well. Um, and now that you know my my oldest stepson is at uni, um, you know we we don't really have all three kids in the car anymore. Right. It's, it's not like we're going to go on a family outing with with everyone in the car, so we don't need yeah. a big car. Um, so, you know, we said, like, okay, well, we'll downsize the car. And so in doing so, it actually enabled us to say like, well, we're saving so much money doing this that it's actually feasible for us to, you know, to, to get another mode of transport and to buy a Vespa um, and run that because we're still saving money. So now we're actually, you know, we're quits in and yeah. we've got two modes of transport rather than one. Mm -hmm. um, and it's worked. It's worked absolutely fine. So my wife and I did. It's one of the things we did together. We did the, um, you know, we did the the motorcycle test thing together, um, and uh, and so now she can she can hop on and go to yoga, you know, or whatever, <laughs> you know, and uh, and and I, you know, um, you could do most basic shopping runs on it, and uh, and and I've you know I've started using it for for work related stuff. So. That's great. That's, That's a great idea. Love that. Love that. And it's also super cool. <laughs> I bet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Vespas are cool. 
So the other aspect of wedding photography, obviously, is just to come back to that, is mm. is the the amount of time you spend editing. Because I think for those for those listeners who shoot weddings, of course, you're totally aware of that. But you know, if you don't, I mean, the shoot is only the the start of it. It's really oh, yeah. the editing time afterwards um, that takes up massively, massively. Yeah. No, uh, uh, you're quite right. It's, it's it's not the wedding day; it's the editing that takes up most of your time. Mm. It will take up most of your time if you're doing it yourself that is <laughs> incidentally that's why wedding photographers cost so much money because it's you're not just paying them for the eight hours on on the wedding day exactly exactly uh, uh <laughs> i it, it it's it's annoying when people assume that that or they say you you charge how much for one day of work like well it's not one day is it um as as we all know but yeah so but most of the time is is the editing side of things and it can take me a couple of days to edit a wedding. So if I've got five backed up, that's a long time in front of my machine. And now I'm a dad, I want to spend even less time in front of this. Um, the, I used to say the more time you spend in front of this, then the less time you're going to be outside actually earning money. And now I say, as well as that, less time in front of your 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 family and your friends. Um, and if now there's uh, there are services out there i used to use a, a service that edited my um a human edited my images as a editing editing house and the way that was all set up it was quite a lengthy process to set up because you have a chat with your editor um kind of like this you share your screen you edit a few images they ask you loads of questions you send your presets um and then the process is that they edit 20 random images if you're happy with them um if you're not then you just give them little feedback um then if you're happy then they will then do the whole wedding um and then they charge i was being charged about 18p a photo um and the and then i would get them back maybe a week and a half maybe two weeks later how many how many um shots do you typically take at a, a typical wedding um at a typical wedding i can take i can take around three thousand images um and then there's a second shooter so they might they might have um, 500 to a thousand images depending on who I use um, so yeah I, I could have about 4,000 images but obviously I'm not editing ed all of those I will cull those images and I will deliver around 700 images around seven eight nine hundred images um, so that that's how many I'm sending off to be edited uh, at, so yeah about 18p a photo so it might be a couple of hundred pounds um, which is nothing compared to the the, the cost of being with your friends and family however having said that um i no longer use them anymore because now uh, as you said there's now ai services out there that will do your edits for you and um, so i use a, a service called imagine ai which i've started using this year and the way that uh, imagine ai works is you upload three thousand of your previously edited shots via your lightroom catalog uh, obviously you've got to make sure that they've they've been consistent um, with with your with your thing with your preset, and then it learns your profile, creates a profile. So then after that, you then send them a future Lightroom catalog, and it will edit the images for you. And it will take about half a second to edit each image. So I can have an entire wedding back in ten minutes, fully wow. edited. That's incredible. And it, and it costs me five p a photo. I, there's a six pound subscription. So regardless whether you have whether you've edited anything that week or that month, you'll get charged six pounds a month. And then on top of that, it's five P a photo, which so an entire wedding cost me about 40 pounds. So it's so much cheaper and so much faster than having a human edit it for me. So much better. And now I've got time back with my family and friends. It sounds too good to be true. And I totally empathize with that because I thought the exact same. Um, but if you want to learn more, if you go to my YouTube channel, um, usually you get a thousand free images edited, but if you check out the link in, um, I don't know if you'll have show notes, but if you check out my usual channel, um, there'll be a link there where you can see see how it works briefly and get 1500 free edited images. So about one or two completely edited weddings, you can give it a go, give it a try for free. It's so worth it. Absolutely. And I'll put we'll put a link to your YouTube channel in the description below, obviously. Um, and, okay. a, and a link to um, to that discount as well. That'd be that's a fantastic thing. I mean, uh, you know, only last week uh, I spoke to Michael Burke, 
about artificial intelligence in photography and it blew my mind. <laughs> anybody, you know, anybody who, I, I tell you what, anybody who was listening to last week's episode, um, if you get a chance, you know, hop over to YouTube and check out the actual, you know, Technicolor version of it uh, because you'll actually get to see the images that he was talking about. It, it was entirely, totally insane. Um, I know. I mean, we you know we spoke about Dali um, on the sh- on the show um, a few months ago, but even between then and now, so this was like I guess this was probably in August or something. Mm-hmm. I think we did an episode about Dali, uh, but even just in that short time between August and now, that artificial intelligence technology has already improved so much. It's mm-hmm. it's just it's absolutely mind blowing. Oh, it's crazy. Um, I, I I used to use Mid Journey, which is the app via the, the uh, uh, via Discord, and it's mind blowing. I I I was saying to you just before we came on, I I had to get a subscription because I used all my free credits because I went through a stage where I was creating loads of random random visuals, and it is addictive. It can get quite addictive, but it's just insane what it can create. You can be so detailed, and it will and it will. And it would do it. There's nothing beyond beyond it. It's absolutely insane. I, I, I even I even like uh, have signed up to a, a Facebook group where people use Mid Journey, and so there's some art students using it in their work as well, um, and and passing it off as their own, which is naughty. But I don't know what is it, technically is. It's there's no copyright. Is there? I, I don't know what the logistics around this is. It is it. Um, is is it original? Is it your content? I don't, I don't know, but um, I'm just playing with it. It's just fun. Yes, yeah, so, I mean technically, I think you know as far as I understand it. And again, you know, Micah explains that actually really quite well. Um, the because it's not a matter of uh, of the AI going going to find other images and then taking taking actual elements of these images and combining it into a new image. That would be a different thing because then I think you know the original creator of that part of the image would generally have a claim to the copyright right. there. But what it actually does is it learns about a certain thing, like what skies look like and what landscapes look like and what Nordic fjords look like and whatever. And then if your prompt says, you know, you know, create an image of um, a, a dramatic image of a Nordic fjord in winter or whatever, it will then take that learned information and create something that is entirely new. Wow. And the... I mean, and, and again, the results are photorealistic, you know, uh, but this fjord doesn't actually exist. It's not like anybody's taken a photo of this particular fjord, fjord before. Right, it's just right. it's a brand new thing. Um, and the way it does that um, is by a process of diff- called diffusion, where essentially it takes, let's say it takes an image of a cat um, and it then applies blur to that cat and compl- completely diffuses it to the point where it's completely unrecognizable. But then it has access to like several billion images of cats and then it recreates an image out of all of that blur um, and it creates an image of a brand new cat that doesn't exist has never existed and as Micah says it's nobody's pet it's a brand new cat um, but it looks like a cat that's insane I did wonder how how it I didn't even know how, how it worked and I did wonder is it taking elements from other other people's artwork um, from what you know, it's, so, it's, it's got Google. I don't know. Yeah. So, so the best way I, I thought the best way to describe it is, is a little bit like when you go, imagine you go to an art gallery. Yeah. And you look at lots of different artists and you know, some of the, the great masters of the past. And you learn, you know, you learn about their style and you take it all in and you look at a lot of those images. And then you go home and you paint an image, a brand new picture. Let's say in the style of right, yeah, right. So you're not infringing a copyright because you're not nicking anybody else's photograph or or painting or whatever, but you're creating a new piece of art, which then rightly you are the owner of that copyright. Yes, okay, that's a good way of yeah. uh, explaining it. But I mean, I know that because this is all brand new technology, and of course, with things developing at such a fast moving pace. Um, there may very well be a need at some point for you know copyright law to be amended to reflect some of that. Um, mm-hmm. I know that a lot of big manufacturers are holding back some of the technology because they're looking at how that develops, how you know how the general public 
response to that technology and mm. what the general path of opinion is going to be. And then I think that's a wise thing because, you know, because that, that copyright infringement issue is going to be in the back of, of everybody's mind. Right, right. Yeah, it's 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 interesting. It's it's interesting. It's so fresh, so new, and as you say, we don't know how to kind of respond to it and what should the norm, what should what should the rules be regarding this going forward because it's just so new. Yeah, it's it's, it's interesting. Well, you did the interesting thing about what you just said earlier when you explained, um, you know, imagine AI. Um, you know, the fact that you basically you pour in three thousand of your own images into the thing, it then learns your process and how you how you see things and how I, I think it even goes down to the how you crop things of what your preferred way of cropping is yeah, and all that kind of stuff yeah yeah and, and that's an optional thing so you don't have to uh, it doesn't have to crop or you and it doesn't have to straighten the images either but yeah. you can tick both of those um and it will do that which i do and it does it does it really good there was one occasion where i had edited a bunch of random images throughout the day and you can set it so that it obviously only edits non-edited images so it left the ones that i had edited and i did that on purpose because i wanted to see how it compared to uh, uh, images that i edited say from the dance floor and then it will obviously edit the shot either side of it so i so i know that you know a second ago or a second before it's gonna there'll be another shot and imagine we'll edit it and then i did that obviously throughout the day and i have to say there was one occasion where like Actually, that's bet that's been edited better than I than the example I've just done. So I copied their their one, my one, their one, and pasted it onto their thing. And I mean, we're only talking very subtle differences, like oh, the ex uh, they the color is better, the exposure was slightly better, they, they they it added more contrast, and I and I actually it looked better. So little things like that, it's it blew my mind. It's so it's so good. It's so so good. And now from a marketing point of view, you could be quite savvy as a wedding photographer and even offer, say, a rush service. If you want the images done within a week, pay X amount and it will be done. The reality is you can do it in ten minutes. Obviously you've got to cull it first. And that's something else actually. They're about to release um imagine they're about to release a service where it will cull the images for you as well. Now, this isn't new. There is another uh, company called Aftershoot, and that's all they that's do right. yeah, is just, right. just cull. Admittedly, I have used it, and I, there was something about having AI cull my images that I couldn't quite get on board with. I can get on board with them editing the images because it's coming from... Because it's, uh, because it's, it's already... The foundation is my preset. With the cull... You put certain parameters in, but there are certain things where, I don't know, there's a trust thing that I can't get over. So when it culled my 4,000 images, I couldn't help but go through all of the ones which it chose to reject to see okay. why it rejected it. And there was one occasion in it, and, and that was it. Then, I'll, then I thought, I can't trust it. There was one occasion where it rejected an image of, say, um, it was dad crying, and he, it was like that. And, he, and after shoot rejected it because... His eyes were closed. It didn't know he was crying. Obviously, it, how, how would it know that? But I thought, oh, no, I definitely would have kept that. So because of that, I still cull the images myself, which arguably takes less time than it does to edit. So I'm glad it's that way around. I'm glad that culling, I, I'll cull it and then imagine we'll edit it. And I'm happy with that. It can cull, but I can't quite get on board with it yet, personally. I just, I did exactly the same thing earlier. I, um... I shot. I saw. I shot a cage fight, a cage fighting event last oh, night. Oh, I saw your Instagram. You, uh, you. It was a picture of the, of the of the ladder you were about to go up, right? Yeah, I spent I spent eight hours on that ladder. <laughs> oh my god, what was that like? Oh, <laughs> uh, it was uh, thirty two fights. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. So you know, as a, as an end result, it was also several thousand images which I've I've culled um, late last night, and um, I'm going to have to go and actually manually edit those. <laughs> oh my Which gosh! Is seriously annoying, but yeah, I mean, I can you know because immediately you know you talk about um, those applications of artificial intelligence that can make your life so much easier. I'm immediately thinking, well, yeah, totally. That completely applies to some of the stuff that I do as well, one hundred percent. Did you um uh, uh, do you do you have a preset then for the cage fighting stuff? Like, could you could yeah. you think could you use Imagine? Have you uh, are you thinking of using? I'm it? Think, I'm thinking of using it. I mean. Um, I'm probably not on this particular one because the turnaround time there is really quick. Um, 
but you know, in general, yes, for those kind of for those sort of things, one hundred percent. The uh, I do use I typically use presets for it. Um, in this particular case, I have a new camera body that I tested out, and I, I, already when I was culling the images, I could see that the results are ever so slightly different. So I might have to mm. tweak a few things, but but uh, yeah, it's an interesting, definitely interesting thing, especially with you know large volume shoots like that. Yeah, well, but but imagine if you if you were in a position where you could send it to Imagine or other AI program, and it and it do, and it's done in ten minutes. Yeah, it's, exactly. It's just a breath of fresh air. It's like um, a weight's been lifted, and now I can spend more time with my friends and family, knowing that it will, it will edit the images sometimes better than me. <laughs> well, because I mean that that really you know that tight that really ties in perfectly uh, with what we started this conversation with, which was you know how to create that balance between family life and and the job, yeah. you know, and it's not really about. I mean, it is about you know it is about um, making sure that you you know, focus on your work times and creating that balance, but it's also about working smarter because... Yeah, yeah. And and someone someone said uh, when when AI was kind of like a year ago, when it was even more in its infancy, someone, someone said to me, that's cheating or that's not right. You shouldn't be doing that. That's... Um, you, you, you should be doing it yourself. And and I said, but it's, all, it, but it's about working smarter not necessarily harder okay. much you'd much rather work smarter and this is just a smarter way of working um i i have a lot of friends who are musicians and sometimes i before imagine i would get I, I would get frustrated that after a wedding or after their job that's it they go home that's it they've got nothing else to do and I'm like oh i've got to go home and then call and then process thousands of images you know the work's the job's not done for me like we we might have been on the same job. They're singing at the wedding, and I'm photographing the wedding, and th- their job is done. But now I can ne- now I can I can meet up with him because I don't have to worry about editing those images. So yeah, it's and the cost is it's why why wouldn't you do it? You, you at least explore it. Um, it's not cheating. I I I'm, I mean okay. I'm not going to tell I'm not going to tell my clients that I'm going that that's what's happening, but. My clients, it's it's all about the audience. My clients are probably not going to be listening to this podcast. It's going to be other photographers. So I'm happy to happy to say it here. Sure. I mean, the other thing yeah. is also, you know, your clients will probably most likely not even care because they, you know, they really just care about the 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 final product, right? You know, how will you get there? I mean, I've never, it never, it in. 10 years or something had this conversation with a client where I'm like, oh, well, you know, I'm going to take your photograph into Lightroom and then I'll do this and then I'll take it into Photoshop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they don't care. I mean, all they care no. about is basically what the final result is. You know, how you got there, uh, you know, first of all, that's changed over the last 25 to 30 years anyway, because, you know, especially we're talking wedding photography. I mean, it wasn't actually in the grand scheme of things. It wasn't that long ago when, you know, the delivery for a typical wedding was like three rolls of 36 images. Yeah. <laughs> you know, or one album of twenty five or something like that. Yeah, right. Right. right? And so, and so nowadays, you know, we're delivering, you know, north of five hundred, sometimes yeah. sometimes north of of, of a thousand images. That's a yeah. whole different ballgame. Oh, massively. Massively, yeah. I remember 100%. I remember talking to um a guy from the old guard in inverted commas. You know, he used to tell me, um <clears throat> back in his heyday of wedding photography back in the eighties or something. Yeah, you know, he used to shoot three weddings a day: one in the morning, one in the afternoon, one in the evening. And oh my god! Yeah, and he would basically deliver the images on the same day. And like, how? What? The, yeah. So what? What he what he used to do is he used to set up um, a little lap in a back room at a at a wedding venue, and he would literally develop the roles like whilst the dinner was going on or something like that, and then he he'd literally deliver an album of twenty five shots or whatever, you know, that very evening or the very next day. And that was it. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. But you can imagine, I mean, there wasn't a lot of editing going on there. It was just a completely different thing. But the clients would have been just as thrilled back then to receive their wedding images in a nicely bound album as they would be now. Only the expectations has shifted. That's right. Because now the expectation is, you know, because I can take half a million images on my cell phone within the next half an hour. You know, I guess the expectation now is that you want to get hundreds of, of photos. But my own personal experience is actually, since you know, it hasn't been that long ago that I got married. I 
the photographer that, that we used also delivered hundreds of images digitally. Uh, but then he also delivered about, I'd say probably about maybe 70 images printed mm-hmm. um, in, in a little box. That was not part of the deal whatsoever. He just did that because he thought it'd be a cool thing to do. Nice, and we're nice. eternally grateful for that mm. because I at a time did not realize, I really didn't realize the value of prints. Mm. In my head at the time, it was like, ah, yeah, digital, absolutely no problem. You know, no worries. But just the fact that we have mm-hmm. that, a really great selection of killer shots in a little box on the windowsill that we can just, you know, flip through once in a while and just, you know, we, we do that quite regularly. We, we take yeah. it on, just have a look at it. You know, that was really something that didn't occur to me in the planning stages of, of my wedding. It's so nice to have something tangible, something you could hold on to. And this has been... Um, when doing online consultations with couples, I mean, now it's become the norm since COVID of doing it online like this. You d- we don't have to see them in person. Um, but at the same time, the only thing that is a struggle is co- is showing them uh, printed work or albums. That's very hard to translate it over over Zoom and getting them excited because they're not feeling it and touching it. So that that is a struggle. So again, where possible, if they're close by, I will suggest that we meet up and the only reason for that is so that they can see touch fill the prints and the albums because I want them like you to see the value in that because uh, can you imagine the idea of looking at our parents wedding albums on a USB stick obviously that it's not a thing because it wasn't a thing back then but imagine that thought of looking at your parents albums or your grandparents albums but you got you got you, you got to put a USB stick in the computer it's like but like, no one really wants to do that but but it comes at a cost and people want to save money and they think well i've got the digital files i'm looking at them back in the day it had to be printed or you couldn't see it but now digital is cheaper because it's digital so it's trying to convince them to pay that extra um to have it have something printed but i like the idea that your photographer did where they just they it wasn't part of the deal they just did it um just so that they can see that value in the printed product. Absolutely. And you know, the, the problem with um, any kind of digital medium or, or carrier, therefore, is that, you know, I mean, even, you know, I remember computers from the 1990s, and there were a lot of formats that are really no longer around. And the amount of times I had to, um, you know, copy things from, you know, first a floppy disk onto a uh, onto a CD and then from a CD to a DVD and then from a DVD onto like some hard drive and then uh, yeah. that's in the cloud. I mean, this is just, you know, we're talking about USB sticks today, but I guess in 20 years time, nobody will even remember those. Do you know what? I said USB sticks and I don't even deliver USB sticks. <laughs> it, it's it's all online um, digital gallery. That's, that's how it is. And they can download the images straight from their gallery. So there's no real need for a USB. St- I mean, some, some computers don't even have a USB port anymore now. So... It doesn't, it, for me, I, that's why I don't deliver USB sticks anymore. Um, but I do try and convince them to get an album. Not because I've, I'm trying to make more money, but because it's something that they want. Digital files can corrupt. They might lose the gallery, the, 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 they might download the images and then the, then they get corrupted. An, Im- an album's not going to corrupt. So I do try and convince them to buy an album. And the way I try and do that, one of the ways I try and do that is I have five packages, which might sound excessive to some, but in the top two packages, if you go for either one of the top two, so for example, if you go top package, you can then buy an album for 50% off just by going with the top package, just to try and convince them to make that purchase. And if they go for package two, then it's 35% off. Um, and that seems to have worked really nicely. I had someone jump from package four to package two. So they jumped not one package to two packages just because they wanted an album and they knew that they could get it at 35% off if they went with that package. And that was one of the core reasons why they went with that was because of the album. And that was an example where I was able to meet up with them and show them the album and the samples, get them to see, touch, feel it, see the quality of the of the artwork. And... It's all about education. So, for example, my albums, they the the ink, the paper is 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 the same quality printed in museums. So it's not going to fade. It's not going to turn yellow. Um, 
if you try and convince if you try and educate them as much as you can and make them realize this is an heirloom so on this occasion i was able to meet up with the couple and they were able to see touch fill which i think is why they were able to jump from a package they were, thought they wanted to a package they ended up going for so that they could get 35 percent off their album and they've also purchased parent albums slightly smaller versions of their main album so that was a really good wedding and really a, a, an example of where meeting up face to face with the couple there's still value there and it's just to show the album and to show the printed products to hopefully sell to them later so you mentioned your your pricing um, structure which is actually there's always something that fascinates me because um i look at at other photographers i mean obviously in the headshot world for example you know looked at loads of lots of other uh, headshot photographers pricing strategies and you know i've ex experimented with different ways of pricing my own headshot business um to that point i've changed a few things but um, I noticed the the kind of add-on kind of features in your pricing, um, mm -hmm. in, the, in your practice, like you mentioned, the um, like the albums, for example. Uh, how did you come up with your pricing structure the way it is now? And has it always been like this? No. So when it started, I started with three packages and um, I didn't even offer albums back in the day. And that was because I hated designing the albums. So now I have AI. I now ha use a, a, a program called Fundy Design, which designs the album for me in a second. It, it does it really, really well. So since getting Fundy, I now started offering albums. And I knew, based on the type of clients that, uh, that, I, that I've been working with, I knew that if I started adding albums to my packages, the first question would be, how much is it without the album? And I didn't want to get into that. So that's why instead of adding them to my top two, I just added two more packages. And so that made them even more expensive. Um, and initially I added on the albums onto the top two packages. So it included an album, um, um, which, which, which worked, which worked well. And, um, but again, people were just asking for, well, can I have that many hours, but without the album? So again, I was getting caught in that. Um, then I decided, okay, I'm going to take the albums out of the packages um, and give them a discount for, for for going for this top package. And everyone loves a discount. Everyone loves that. It's the psychology of it. Um, everyone likes to think that they're getting a deal. So that's uh, that has been a really, really good tip for me. So if you want to try and sell albums, then make it an add-on, but make it a 50% add-on. So so make the make the retail value make sure it's it's a substantial amount of money so that if they did go for the top package and they did get it at 50 percent off you're still making a profit mm -hmm. even at 50 percent off um so for example a 10 by 10 30 page album is on my website 800 pounds but if they go for the top package they can get it for 399 and again, just saying 399 rather than 400 just again sounds better. So that for me is like, well, we're going to get 400 pounds off. It kind of, it it helps them get to that top package. And the difference between the 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 second package and the first package it might be a couple of hours of coverage. I mean, th they're paying a premium for those extra few hours. I'm already there. It's no real cost extra to me just staying at the wedding for a couple of extra hours. Okay, yeah, I'll take more images and there's more hard drive space, but it's nothing really, let's be honest. So, yeah, that's how I now structure the um now structure it. I'm about to add a rush service because of Imagine AI where they can pay say 500 pounds for example and have the images back within within a week. The m most people probably won't go for it. But it's there, and it's there in case someone will pay it, and you earn even more money with that with yeah. that offer. So, since I mean, obviously, uh, so, you know, since since the pandemic, have you um, have you changed any other aspects of your business other than other than the AI implementation and and your pricing structure? Um, in terms of weddings. Well, I would say not necessarily since the pandemic, but more more like since the birth of your son. It's actually oh right. right. Um, oh yeah, yeah, massively. So because since having George, I I totally had a different. Um, as I say, it was only twenty percent of my business. Now it's that was ninety percent. So I changed entirely, changed the website. So I did used to have three Squarespace template websites, and knowing that the wedding, I wanted it to be totally customizable. 
I wanted to add certain things to my website that Squarespace wasn't allowing me to do. So I moved over to WordPress. So I now use a flow themes template, which is powered by WordPress. And that gives you so, so much more flexibility, customization. Um, I do fortunately have a friend who's a web developer. So he was able to help me out with some of the back end of the website stuff and able to um, speed it up as well. And that gives me total uh, customization. So it had a fresh look, fresh branding. Um, I I just dress differently at a weddings. I've got a different approach to it. I'm, I'm de I've, I bought a new camera. The whole reason I bought the Canon R5 was because of weddings was because and it wasn't necessarily the megapixels it was because i wanted that faster autofocus if i was just a studio photographer i'd probably still use my mark three my 5d mark three but that was one of the reasons why i wanted right this is going to be my new thing now weddings is my thing so i got a bought a new lens i bought a um bought the new camera totally rebranded got a new website um and yeah and it's now and a lot and this year i became a highly commended wedding photographer at the wedding industry awards um in my first year of entering which has just been a great testimonial for me and uh the first and only award i've ever won in photography and it was my wedding work and not anything to do in the portrait world <laughs> fantastic um so where do you see your your business going over the next couple of years or the next three to five years. I'd like to be I'd like to be doing shooting more weddings I've got the time and capacity to to shoot more weddings um uh eventually charge more money for for the service so a good way of a lot of things uh, going back to to the package thing briefly lo uh, lots of people ask me how do I how do I earn more money without like is there a way I can earn more money without raising my prices of my of my packages and quite often people will offer packages where, right, I'll give you this and I'll give you this and I'll give you this and I'll give you this. It's like, well, if you want to earn more money without raising your prices, why don't you just take some things out of those packages? So rather than including a uh, hundred prints and an album and, and a second album, just take some of those or all of them away and and maybe make them optional extras at a discounted price. So I don't, uh, and, that, and, that's, and that's very key at a discounted price. I think if you add, make loads of things optional add-ons, then people don't like that. They want to know that they want to be able to pay one package and get it all, which is fine. And if you want to do that, great, but you probably need to charge more money. But if you don't want to charge more money and earn, but earn more money, then take some of those services away, those things you offer away and offer them at a discounted price, which is now what I do. So I don't put the albums in the packages in case people just ask me how much is it without the album so instead i say well uh, here's the package and that's the price that's what it is but if you want an album with it it's 50 percent off so i've got them spending this much and an extra 399 on top so but they think they're getting a discount and i've just earned even more money than i was earning before so it's all a psychology thing um so that that, that there have been the biggest differences that i've made since george since george came along is that kind of mentality just thinking more about it i was thinking so much about youtube and the portrait thing and the wedding thing i just left i didn't really think about it think about the the, the psychology or the package structure back then but now now it is my main focus it's, i think it's, it's a fantastic transformation really um I, just one more thing about uh, when it comes to albums in general i know that a lot of a lot of friends of mine um had to um find new ways of of uh of getting manufacturers to ship their albums over uh, because yeah. i know a lot of my friends were ordering albums from italy for instance before brexit and all that stuff happened yeah great question um yeah glad you brought that up because i totally forgot to mention that and that that is another thing i was using dreambooks pro which are based in portugal and again because of brexit you're quite right um i it it made me look at uk based uh album manufacturers which i now use so i now use folio albums which are based here in the uk and they've got a great message they're very they're more eco-friendly than dreambooks pro and that's that's definitely their what they're trying to push and it's now what i'm trying to push in my sales tactic as well is is talk about it's uk based lovingly handmade in the uk they're eco-friendly this is this is what uh, they use um, the materials they use that from uh, that they're sourced um, in a good way, et cetera, et cetera, all that sort of thing. Because now it's becoming a hot topic, and now, and I believe that's what my clients are in, are are aware of and interested in. 
So when I explain this, and obviously it's cheaper, it's for me, the, the cost of sales is much cheaper because I don't have to worry about it going overseas. Um, ironically, I can order an album from New Zealand and it would get here quicker than it would be if it was flying from Portugal. Um, because there is a, uh, I forget the name, there's a New Zealand one, which is, uh, I forget the name, but it's it's one of the best in the world. But Folio, a UK base, I keep everything in the UK and then that means the delivery to and from is smaller. So yeah, so I use Folio albums and uh, they're great, great quality. And again, we'll, we'll put a link to those um, in the description as well so people can check them out. Um, now, uh, one final thing. Um, uh, that I know a lot of people who might think about getting into wedding photography um, are probably most interested in is like how to get clients. For example, because yeah. when you you know when you made the decision to increase the the wedding side of your of your business, uh, clearly you had to think like, well, okay, but well, now I'm going to have to land some new wedding clients. How did you go about that at the time? So. I think when you look at a journey of a client booking their wedding vendors, the first thing they're going to book is a venue. And usually the photographer comes soon after that. Makeup artists, uh, all, all the all the other ones are kind of generally afterwards. But usually it's the venue and the photographers that are the main purchase that they want to sort out. Maybe the caterers, but sometimes that's supplied with the venue. So if you're starting out, get in with the venue because they if they can recommend you, they likely haven't booked their photographer yet. So if you if you're schmoozing with makeup artists, I don't think that's great because if they once they if they're booking their makeup artists, they probably already booked their photographer by that point in their journey. It's just and I I'm only saying that not to sound horrible or anything like that. It's just that that's been the client journey from even from our point of view, from Emily's point of view, booking her own wedding. So get in with the venues and the way you could do that is you could approach them and say, if you've got any dates coming up where you're having a theme or you're having a wedding fair, you're having um, a showcase or anything like that, um, let me know and I will come and I will shoot the images for free. So for example, they uh, one venue had a, um, I think it was it was a Star Wars themed wedding and it was gonna, be, and it was a big, big wedding. And uh, I said, I'll come and shoot the venue and all the decorations, the details for free. And I did that with some other venues. They had big showcases or they were having open days. And I did it uh, recently with Secret Gardens who were just around the corner from me. I shot their their details and everything they had set up and I sent them to them for free. And then um, then I spoke to the uh, the person who owns that venue and I said, I will, I, I will also offer you a free photo shoot as well if you want a free family shoot. And that if, if you can offer all of that for free, give up your time, become schmoozy with them, then you're going to end up on what's called their preferred vendor list. So that's the point where clients will go to the venue and they will have a list of recommended photographers, recommended videographers. And if you can get on that list, then hopefully you can then land more work. And obviously go to venues that are close and local to you so that you don't have to travel too far. Um, so by doing by shooting their open days, I made it onto their preferred vendor list. And then by shooting the person who does the client, does the meetings, by shooting their family shots for free. Because the first thing that a client will often do, where they'll get the list and go, oh, okay, recommended photographers. Who would you recommend? And they'll point to me because they'll flip the the six by six by four print framed on their desk and say, ah. Oh, this is Tommy Reynolds. He actually did a family shoot for me and my husband and my child, blah, blah, blah. Um, so that's how I've been able to schmooze people. So get in with the venue. The venues are key. Wedding planners also. But if you're starting out, they might be smaller weddings. They might not have a wedding planner, but they're also someone to schmooze as well. But I would say for now, get in with the venues. <laughs> Fantastic tip there. Absolutely amazing. <laughs> Incredible. Well, I, I love the way that you've managed to... Um, you know, not only, you know, overcome things like the pandemic and, um, you know, and, and all the rest of it, but I love the way that you managed to kind of rejig your whole, you know, your whole business and your whole life really around, <laughs> around your family and, and your new arrivals. So it's an absolutely, it's an inspirational story. It's fantastic. Thanks, man. Thank you. That's Thank you very awesome. much. Awesome. Tommy, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. Um, Hopefully, you know, we'll see you again soon. Um, like, as, like I said, we have to get Dave and yourself yes. on the show at Let's the same time. That. That'd be amazing. Let's do that. That'd be fun. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, awesome. Thanks. So, Tommy, again, thank you so much for being here and talking to us. And uh, we will hopefully see you soon.
Thanks, man. Speak to you soon. Take care. We've come to the end of Camera Shake Podcast episode 131 with none other than Tommy Reynolds giving us some super amazing tips as far as the wedding industry is concerned. Um, be reminded that if you are listening to the audio version of this podcast, it is a fully fledged technicolored version over on YouTube. Check that out. Um, and remember, it's always nice to hear from you. So get in touch, send us a message, a DM on Instagram, Facebook, wherever you can find us, TikTok, for God's sake. What's going to be next? Anyhow, that's it for us. We'll see you again next Thursday. <laughs>